Hello, this is Nick here from Gorgon Reviews. I'm talking with Miguel Faust, director of The Quiet Maid, which had its North American premiere last month at the Seattle International Film Festival. The Quiet Maid is about a young Colombian woman who works as a maid in Spain in a summer mansion. Her employee employers are giving her future promises, but eventually she realizes they are not necessarily looking out for her best interests. Thank you so much for spending time here today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Nick. My first and really only icebreaker question is my favorite, and then it is, what is the first movie you remember seeing in theaters growing up? Um, okay, uh, it's been a while since someone asked me that, and I, the short answer is I, I don't know in terms of like seeing. Uh, I remember that my uncle, when I was super young, took me to the first uh, Star Wars, um, the, the first of the of the second trilogy right so mm -hmm. I, I forget which one that is because the I'm Phantom not Menace. Star Wars fans. yeah the phantom menace uh, i remember uh, but i was like maybe i was like four so uh, i all i remember is he took me and i remember i, I fell asleep um <laughs> so you know uh that's uh that's the closest answer i can give normally i would jump straight into your early work in making film but apparently you used to write about film for magazines as well so yes were you a film reviewer who crossed over to the other side? Uh, no, as much as I think a lot of film reviewers would, would like to, to see someone who did, um, I don't think that that's a good definition <laughs> uh, for, for myself. I, I was more uh, an aspiring filmmaker that, um, that realized that um, writing about film uh, and mostly interviewing film directors would be would be useful for me uh, as, as an educational um, project so I, I did it in, in that way like I was very focused on becoming a filmmaker and um, I started writing like kind of criticism or some or something like that just so they would let me uh, they would know that I knew what I was talking about and they would let me interview directors and then once that happened I never went back to actually reviewing and then I just used it to to be a vampire and, and suck as much uh, um, knowledge from filmmakers as I could. Yeah. Uh, you obviously love film. You went to film school. Was there a particular moment when you decided movies were what you wanted to do growing up? Uh, yes. Yeah, so it all started with Pulp Fiction, uh, finally, mm -hmm. um, which I think a lot of, you know, maybe that's, uh, the, the, you know that's typical you know uh, Tarantino is, is is such a great filmmaker but also it's a filmmaker that really makes you love cinema when you are a teenager and that's what happened to me I was uh, 16 or 15 I watched Pulp Fiction and I was fascinated um, but more than my like say uh, emotional fascination with the film and, and feeling transported and all of that it was a very rational fact that through Pulp Fiction and Tarantino's um, tropes that he used in all of his films, which I discovered just after watching it by Googling, that when I discovered that, you know, his obsession with like bare feet or uh, tr shots from the car trunk or things like that, that's when I realized what a, what a director was. Like, you know, it's a, it's a weird thing. Like film director, when you're a teenager, you don't really understand what it is. And then through understanding that, Tarantino did several things in all of his films. Uh, it dawned on me that the director was sort of like the creative force behind everything in a movie. And that it was quite similar to writing a novel or, or painting a picture just with a, with a movie. And that sounded like the best job in the world to me at that time. And I thought, well, this is awesome. Let's, you know, create inventing a world and then filming it uh, seemed like a, uh, I don't know, perfect for me because I was always very imaginative and very artistic, but I had never found like my thing. Yeah. It'd be interesting if you actually saw that one in theaters when you were like two or whatever. Probably yeah, would have awesome. it too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I will um, take my two year old when I have one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for your first short film, The Death of Don Quixote, uh, that's an interesting subject matter. Um, how did that one come about briefly? Um, it's an obsession of mine, uh, Don Quixote, uh, because I, I read it like when I was in, in college and I loved it. And um, and also another obsession of mine are uh, films about film, um, like uh, Fellini's Eight and a Half, and, but so many others. And then I, I, I 
I realized that those obsessions were very connected because Don Quixote is the the great meta novel, and so I so I, I it came about just by having this uh, epiphany that the two things were very related and that I could put them together in, in a film, and that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And then you did uh, Caladita, which is a short film that eventually grew into The Quiet Maid, which was yes. also called Caladita originally. Um, uh, where... Well, it's still the Spanish title. Okay. We just have a, an English title for international uh, purposes. Yeah. But Caladita okay. is still, uh, yeah. And where did this story come from, the short? Um, well, really, the story for the short and the feature came together because it was always a feature in my mind. Um, mm -hmm. I just needed to do a short at, at that time um, because I need to graduate from my film school and also I needed a proof of concept in order to, to be able to make the feature, essentially. Um, and it came from an interest in, in doing like a um, satirical portrait of, uh, of a certain type of bougie uh, environment in, in mm -hmm. Spain that, that I knew uh, somewhat and I wanted to, to satirize. And then I, I realized that doing it through the eyes of the domestic worker, of, of a living domestic worker, uh, was, was very interesting because uh, it offered uh, many fascinating possibilities. And so that was the, the core of the idea from the start. Okay, so you always knew you wanted to turn into a feature-length film. Awesome. Yes. And for both of them, you had Paula Grimaldo as the lead. How do you know that she was perfect for your role? intuition i would say i, I couldn't uh, explain it um very rationally but um you know um i just felt it in my gut very strongly that um that she was anna and that she had everything needed to be a star and to and to portray this character in a very strong way mm -hmm. uh to bring it to a slightly different side there's the obvious famous trivia about your film um that is the first European fiction film ever to be funded by NFTs. Um, yes. And I often hear the hardest part of any film production, especially for indie films, is just finding the funding. So was there an interesting story behind this? Or why NFTs in general? Yes, uh, very much a very interesting story. How much time do you have? <laughs> I have all the time. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, because, you know, I, 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 I do like, a, like three hour classes at film schools just to explain this so you know i, I, need, to, I need to realize uh, what version of, of this story do you want uh, but yeah definitely the why a, you a did it not uh, how you did it i guess <laughs> why yeah the why what the why is the the simplest part and and uh, and the easiest to to explain and understand uh, because i needed to make this film and I, I i i wasn't able with the more traditional methods of uh film financing uh, here in, in Spain and Europe, which mostly rely on public funding bodies. Um, and I, I, the why is uh, closed doors, essentially. I found too many closed doors and uh, ended up um, deciding that I needed to find a new path. Yeah. I won't go into specifics for the film plot, but NFTs actually matter for the story as well. Um, yes. I would say the ending of the film from roughly... Anna prepping for her date, let's say, and onwards, which was full of a lot of tense moments that personally had me on the edge of my seat, which I wasn't even expecting early on in the film. You mm -hmm. know, it's quiet made. We're relaxing. We're just watching, you know, we're, we're experiencing yeah. it. And then it just ramps up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for I, unfortunate reasons. Yeah, I guess it's unfortunate that the, that the English title doesn't capture the irony uh, yeah. that is very present in the Spanish title. And I thought it might, but I'm realizing with with like with what you just said and other people uh, that it, it it's it's lost on most people that the quiet maid is an ironic title and uh, she's uh, required to be quiet but uh, she will fight uh, mm. that that, re that requisite. Yeah, um, this film mostly takes place in one setting, so this might not have been that much of an issue. But was there one part of the film that was much harder to shoot and get right than the rest of the film? I mean, it's uh, it's um, deceptively simple because, like, maybe eighty percent of the film happens within this location, uh, mm -hmm. this big mansion. 
but the other 20% mostly happens in places or, or situations that are quite difficult to film normally, like beaches or even a, a beach party at night, a uh, boat, uh, cars, uh, bicycles, roads. So it's, it's all... Um, so, you know, we, I always thought, oh, this is a very easy film to make. But then in the first meetings with my line producer and my um, first AD, they were very quick to inform me that uh, it was deceptively easy and that uh, there, will be, there will be a handful of uh, shooting days that are, are very challenging. And so maybe, maybe the beach, but I don't know, because the night scene at the beach was always very, uh, how do you say, um, uh, intimidating to me. I thought it would be very difficult, and also the weather was horrible that night. But then the rain stopped, um, and we started filming, and it all went super well. So uh, it ended up being quite smooth. Awesome. Uh, you went to visit the SIF Festival um, for at least one of the screenings here, if not both of them. How was that experience and the crowds in Seattle? It was amazing. Um, well, uh, yeah, in general, I, I always love to travel with the film and and uh, receive like the feedback of the audience and, 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 and see how they react to the film and how they take it. And it, uh, in Seattle, it, it was awesome. I loved the city. I, I had never been and, the, you know, great food and, and great vibe. But then also the festival was, was awesome. They treated me very well and being able to and the audience was great um we had a lot of fun on the q a uh and people seemed to love the film i think my films in general and and the quiet made in particular plays really well for american audiences and i don't have um a very like smart reason or or anything i just feel like um sort of uh Art house European cinema uh, sometimes is like very, it's a category that that is, is hard to to define and, and and weird sometimes for American audiences and, and Cayadita or the Quiet Mate is easier to to compare with more of an indie American cinema than perhaps with a certain that type of art house European cinema and in that and maybe that's the reason why it plays well with American audiences. <laughs> Uh, once again, thank you so much for spending time to uh, answer some questions about The Quiet Made and directing in general. It was a bit of a struggle to even find this time to talk, so I'm glad we got it together. Normally yeah. now, I would then say, this is when you can watch it at the festival, but obviously that was like, I don't know, weeks ago. Uh, yeah. Any idea on where people might see your movie in the future? Yes, so um, this isn't out yet, so I can't say too much, uh, but uh, just uh, don't worry because uh, if you are in North America, you're going to be able to watch it pretty soon at home. That's yes. all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And with that, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. Brilliant. Thank you.